Welcome in to Outkick the Show. I hope all of you are having fantastic Thursdays. My name is Clay Travis. I'm encouraging you not to be a pussy. And this show is brought to you by Odd Shark. Go to Odd Shark for all of your gambling and informational related needs. And while you're at it, how about you also go to thehomeloanexpert.com and get hooked up right now with a spectacular rate. If you got a rate in the 4% on your mortgage, they can get you in the 2%. Whether you need a new mortgage, whether you need to get pre-qualified, whether you need to go ahead and get refied, go get hooked up with them now. And if you do go to the Home Loan Expert and you mention Clay Travis or Outkick, then my guy Ryan Kelly will take care of you and you will be well on your way to saving a bundle of money. Plus, you'll get a membership at Outkick VIP for free as soon as you close on your mortgage and they notify me that you have done so as many of you are beginning to do. Uh, Also, because we're in the business of making money, time to make money. If you need great talent for your business but you're short on time, you don't have to get lost in a huge stack of resumes to find the perfect hire. You just need the right tools, smarter tools. And with ZipRecruiter, you can post your job to over 100 of the web's leading job boards Just one click so you can rest easy knowing your job is being seen by the right candidates. Then ZipRecruiter puts its smart matching technology to work, actively notifying qualified candidates about your job within minutes of posting so you receive the best possible matches. No wonder 80% of employers who post on ZipRecruiter get a quality candidate through the site in just one day. My friends, you need to know ZipRecruiter, the smartest way to hire. And you can do it right now. Find out why a growing number of businesses of all sizes and industries use ZipRecruiter to find the most qualified job candidates. Right now, my listeners can post jobs on ZipRecruiter for free. That's right, for free. Uh, just go to ZipRecruiter.com slash OutKick. That's ZipRecruiter.com slash OutKick. And one more time, if you want to try that for free, ZipRecruiter.com slash OutKick. All right, here we go. Off and running. Got some college football gambling picks, giving you a rundown on what's going to take place on the show today. College football gambling picks, Andrew Luck out for the season. How about Snoop Dogg? Did you see the picture he posted of a dead Donald Trump uh, and saying, like, make America crip again? How that is evidence of an unbelievable double standard that exists in our modern media. And there has been a discovery of a new room somehow in the Great Pyramid. There's a new room they didn't know existed for the last 5,000 years. Uh, This is real. This is not a made-up story. They have discovered a new room, uh, and we will run through all that. But before I get to my gambling picks, I want to tell you two different interesting stories. Um, Two different interesting stories. If you are paying attention to the gambling odds for who's going to be the next coach at Florida and who's going to be the next coach at Tennessee, this is amazing. I told you to take Scott Frost at 7-1 to to be the next coach of Florida. He has plummeted all the way from 7-1 to one to minus 130. So there's like a 60-some-odd-ish ish percent chance that Vegas is telling you that Scott Frost is going to be the guy at the University of Florida. He has become the prohibitive favorite when it comes to a betting online. If you believe that those are right, is that right? 55% equate to minus 130. Whoever does that, 60%, 55%, whatever the massive numbers are. John Gruden. His numbers continue to come down at Tennessee as well. At Tennessee now, John Gruden is 2-1. to one. He be- debuted at 20-1. to one. It was plus 250 for a while. Money continues to come in on John Gruden. Now down to plus 200. I believe, based on people I've talked to, that Butch Jones has already been fired and he is just serving the remainder of the season as basically the interim coach. And as a result... Tennessee has made the decision to move on. It appears that they're after John Gruden. So that's going to be intriguing to see whether or not you believe these bet online odds. I always think one of the best places to go to get a sense for who's going to be signed is these offshore accounts uh, because people can actually put money where their mouth is. And if you believe those, right now, Florida Gators minus 130 to hire Scott Frost and John Gruden at plus 200 to be hired by the University of Tennessee. So the picks went up a day late today because I had a big story that I put up yesterday about Tennessee's inability to uh, actually get everything done uh, when it came to keeping its players healthy, particularly Brett Kendrick. Now I'm going to give you 11 winning picks and they start on Friday. So tomorrow these picks are going out. You guys need to be paying attention 
uh, because a lot of these games are going to be played. Two of them are going to be played on Friday and you're going to miss them otherwise. Marshall at FAU. In Lane Kiffin's offense, we trust. I'm going to put as much money as I possibly can down on Lane Kiffin and FAU to cover that line. Opened at 10.5. Money has actually come in on FAU. It's now just FAU minus 7.5, meaning you can buy it down to 7. I think that's a pretty good move. Memphis at Tulsa, down minus 12. I love Riley Ferguson on the road. Riley Ferguson uh, has done, what did I say the math? 12 touchdowns, 2 interceptions in his last 4 games. Go Tigers. Uh, Ole Miss at Kentucky. I love the over here. This uh, this is amazing. Ole Miss's defense has given up 44, 35, 40, and 38 in its last four weeks of SEC play. A shootout is going to happen in Lexington. Easily over. I gave it to you at 62. It's now up to 63 and a half. I think both these teams score 30 or more. The over is the play there. Ohio State at Iowa. I think this is crazy. To me, this is a crazy line. Iowa all the way up to an 18-point underdog right now. You'll remember that the only way Penn State got out of Iowa was with a late touchdown pass. You'll also remember that Iowa beat Michigan last year. 18 points is a massive, absolutely massive favorite for a road team coming off a huge win like Ohio State is. I just think that's too many points. So I am on Iowa plus 18. Western Kentucky at Vanderbilt, the line 9.5. I actually got it all the way up at 11 earlier this week. I think Vanderbilt is favored by way too many points in this game right now. The Vanderbilt defense in the last five games has given up 34 or more in every game on defense. It used to be that there was a situation here where you could rely on Derek Mason's defense at least. The defense now has fallen apart at Vanderbilt in their five straight losses. So I love right now everything about Western Kentucky plus nine and a half. Texas plus seven at TCU. It's now Texas plus seven. Uh, I'm telling you right now, Texas plus seven is the play. Here are the last three times Texas has played a top 10 team at the time. They lost to USC by three in overtime. They lost to Oklahoma by five. They lost to Oklahoma State by three in overtime. I'm telling you, there's a good chance Texas actually wins this game at TCU. South Carolina at Georgia. I love Georgia minus 22 and a half and the over 46. It's now up to Georgia 24 and a 45. I love Georgia here. Love the over. Make a play. Get rich. Uh, Virginia Tech minus two at Miami. Interesting stat here. Miami has won the last four games by four, eight, one, and five points. The last four for Miami, even though they're undefeated. Those wins have come against teams that have gone a combined 11 and 20. I think that Virginia Tech is going to win this game outright on the road. I love Virginia Tech minus two here. Again, great stat. Miami's won their last four games by four, eight, one, and five. And the teams that they have beaten by those margins, a combined 11 and 20. I think Virginia Tech wins this game outright. My blood bank guarantee. Florida at Mizzou plus three. I think Mizzou is going to win this game by double digits. Drew Locke, here's a great stat for you. In the last four games, he's thrown 18 touchdowns and two interceptions. Hit the, hit the vein, hit the vein. Mizzou is going to win this one by double digits. And some of you are going to say, yeah, but what about the competition? Okay, he's played Idaho and UConn, but he has also gone on the road against uh, Kentucky and against Georgia. And he has gone for seven touchdowns and one interception in his last two SEC road games. The Mizzou offense has gotten fixed ever since the bye week. And here's a great stat, stat for you out there. Mizzou scored 28 points at Georgia in their game. Putting that into context, the rest of the SEC combined has scored 24 points against Georgia this season. So Mizzou's offense by itself scored more against Georgia than the rest of the SEC has combined in this game. Oklahoma at Oklahoma State, I love the over. I think it's going to be a tight game. I think at Bedlam is going to be an incredible ride. I love the over here. And if you want a five-game parlay, let's have some fun on the parlay. 100 bucks down, you'll win 2500 This is a fun bet. I love to bet parlays, even though you don't get true odds. You have a lot of fun with them. I love Western Kentucky, Ole Miss Kentucky in the over, Florida at Mizzou. Uh, I love Mizzou. Marshall at Florida Atlantic, 7.5, and, and Memphis minus 12 at Tulsa. Parlays are fun to play. I know the pros say don't do them, but I've won a lot of money this year on parlays. Uh, because And plus, they're just fun. Uh, you don't have to bet five different games. If you want to bet five different games, would you rather put down 20 bucks on five different games or put down 100 and have to hit all five to win uh, 2,500? Or if you hit all five, you win 100 bucks or whatever the math is there. 
I would a lot rather go for the big swing. So those are all the gambling picks. Uh, now let's move on to this Snoop Dogg pick. I think this Snoop Dogg pick is amazing. Have you guys seen this story? I'm going to show it to you if you haven't seen it. Uh, I took a picture of it um, on my phone here. Can you guys see that? That is Snoop Dogg. I'm going to show it to Periscope and Facebook. That's Snoop Dogg lining up next to a picture of a dead Donald Trump. And he's got Trump on the shoe tag there. And the, the tagline is, Make America Crip Again. Can you guys see that on Facebook? Uh, multimedia here. That's my phone. That is uh, Donald Trump uh, seeing uh, this situation. Um, again, Make America Crip Again. I'll hold it up this way too. You can also just Google it yourself. This picture is all over the internet. What I think is fascinating about this is, can you imagine if someone other than Snoop Dogg, i.e. A, uh, a musician of some sort, had put a picture up of Barack Obama laying on an operating table, a uh, morgue table, with a, t with a toe tag on it? Can you imagine if a white musician had put a picture up of Barack Obama laying on the morgue table with a toe tag of Obama on it, what the reaction would have been. Or even Hillary Clinton dead. It would have been mass outrage, but particularly with Barack Obama last time. One of the things that I'm fascinated by in our modern era is how we treat like situations extremely differently in the media. There's no way that a white musician who put a toe tag on Barack Obama and said something about like basically endorsing the idea of him being dead as part of his musical interests would ever be allowed to do that. It would be a major international story almost immediately. So why is it that you can do that about Donald Trump? I think it's utterly fascinating and I would love to hear your answers or your suggestions on either Facebook or Periscope. Why is it okay to root for Donald Trump to die but if you had done the same thing for Barack Obama, it would have been totally unacceptable. Um, this is, uh, this is uh, because he's white. That's right. It's because he's a white guy. White guys, you can say anything about in this modern society. That's true. The standard of protected speech for white guys is almost negligible. But because Donald Trump is a white guy, you can say whatever you want about him. There's no equal standard of treatment for the president, the past two, in this situation. And the media, I believe, is responsible for that. i got another story for you that I think is fascinating. I retweeted Ben Shapiro's article on this, but I've talked about it before. When the Dylan Roof, the uh, South Carolina shooter, killed the people at the, uh, at the Alabama church, immediately people went through social media and found a picture of him with the Confederate flag and decided the Confederate flag should be banned because this guy had decided to kill nine people while uh, being associated with it. When the Charlottesville incident happened and somebody, that guy driving that car who was from Ohio decided to kill uh, a random protester in Charlottesville in his car, everybody immediately started saying we've got to take down all of the Confederate statues. What I find amazing is every time that we have a terror attack that's motivated by Islamic fundamentalism and there are all these pictures of the terrorists holding up the Koran and everything else, nobody says... We should ban the Koran. Think about it. Symbols mean different things to different people. And I'm not saying we should ban the Koran. Far from it. I'm saying that symbols mean different things to different people. And so why would you assume that everybody who is in any way got the Confederate flag, and I've got it in a picture that I have in my room right now from the Civil War, why would you assume that everybody who holds up the Confederate flag in any way is racist and is having the same beliefs as Dylan Roof, if you're in the media. Yet, every time that an Islamic fundamentalist who kills based on his religion does that, nobody ever says, you know what, we have to connect this to his religion. Even though the religion is the direct motivating factor behind his decision to commit a murder. Therefore, his religion is directly connected to the murder. Whereas the Confederate flag can mean many things to many different people. It can be a symbol of heritage. It can be a symbol of hate. It can be a symbol of history. Most symbols have multiple meanings. So why is it that as soon as somebody like Dylan Roof commits a murder, everybody who has ever been associated with the Confederate flag is immediately assumed to be an awful human being, but whenever a terrorist kills, everybody who is uh, Islamic 
is immediately we're lectured in the media, oh, this has nothing to do with Islam. Islam is a religion of peace. That may be true for a lot of people, but for a lot of people, it's also a religion that demands murder and the payment of all of these different um, all these different payoffs when you become a martyr and go to what you believe is the afterlife as a supporter of your faith. Also, the Islamic faith is incredibly retrogressive in its treatment of women by and large. It's amazing to me that the left wing in this country is so incredibly quick to protect people who are of the Muslim faith despite the fact that those people don't allow basic freedoms to women in much of the world and so quick to denigrate the Christian faith in this country. And I say this as an impartial observer. I find it to be incredibly fascinating the ways that the media responds that are completely dishonest and inauthentic and artificial. And it is, to me, remarkable the degree to which it occurs. And again, I'm going to hold this picture up for those of you who haven't seen it. But this was, uh, this was Donald Trump. And I defend, look, I defend Snoop Dogg's right as an artist to do whatever he wants. That's Snoop Dogg with Donald Trump on a toe tag. That's Donald Trump on a toe tag for Snoop Dogg. I defend his right under the First Amendment to do this. But how in the world does this not create an incredible controversy? Uh, is this not somewhat close to what Kathy Griffin got fired for at CNN when she held up a severed head of Donald Trump and was trying to make send a message uh, about First Amendment? She has First Amendment right to do it. But how is Donald? How is Snoop Dogg doing this very much different in kind at all other than the fact that he's a black guy and Kathy Griffin was a white woman? Why is the standard different for speech based on your race, your gender, your ethnicity, or your sexual interests? To me... The standard for speech should be the same for everybody. And I believe in free speech, but I also believe in the media holding everybody accountable in an even perspective. And did you guys see these? There was an interesting study from the Cato Institute, uh, and I wanted to just share some of these stories with you because I couldn't believe them. Uh, what people actually believe. I, I posted some of these on Twitter, and again, it's a study from the Cato Institute. These are real things. Uh, the state of free speech is... Uh, white people, black people, and Hispanic people have different thoughts. This is, this is, an, this is really uh, scary. Supporting someone's right to say racist things is as bad as holding racist views yourself. 65% of black people believe that's true. In other words, you're standing up for the First Amendment rights, which is what I do, and it makes total sense to me now, the responses that I get on Twitter. 65% of black people and 61% of Hispanic people believe that allowing people to have racist statements is the same thing as holding racist views yourself. 65%, two-thirds of black people over 6 in 10 of Hispanic people. 34% of white people believe it. So when I look at social media, it actually makes a lot of sense. People who, this is a crazy stat too, people who don't respect others don't deserve the right of free speech. 59% of black people, 62% of Hispanic people believe that if you don't respect others, you don't deserve the right of free speech. Of course, what does respect to others mean? Nobody actually knows. It's tough to define that. These are scary stats, again, from the Cato Institute. I tweeted these out. This is even crazier. Words are violence, basically. This is an expansive de de definition of violence that the far left wing wants to embrace in a modern era. It's absolutely terrifying that this is gaining cogency. Hate speech is an act of violence. 75% of black people, 72% of Hispanic people, and 46% of white people believe that hate speech is an act of violence. These are all stats you can go see on my Twitter feed, at Clay Travis. Uh, this, is, uh, this is unbelievable to me. Um, and this is also t uh, scary as well. This is why I call myself a radical moderate. Uh, here is another, uh, the, uh, another bit of survey news from the state of free speech in this country. 51% of strong liberals, I don't know what a strong liberal is defined, I'm sure it's defined in this study, say it's morally acceptable to punch Nazis. 51% believe it's morally acceptable to punch Nazis. 53% of Republicans favor stripping U.S. citizenship from people who burn the American flag. That's fucking insane too. All right, these stats are insane. These, major these are majority opinions. I don't think you should burn the American flag, 
but I certainly don't think that we should then strip your citizenship if you do it. Uh, 51%, this is unbelievable, 51% of Democrats support a law that requires Americans use transgender people's preferred gender pronouns. Over half of Democrats believe that the United States Congress should pass a law demanding that everyone in the country use somebody else's transgender person's preferred gender pronouns. In other words, you would break the law if you called someone a he, a she, or a z and they didn't like it. That's fucking crazy. This is real life. This is a Cato Institute study. 40, this is crazy too, 47% of Republicans favor bans on building new mosques. I, look, I think that there's a lot of terrorists in this country who are motivated by the Islamic faith, but I think it's batshit insane that 47% of Republicans favor banning the building of new mosques. At its very most basic core, we have freedom of religion in this country. Banning the building of mosques, nearly half of Republicans right now don't allow it. 58% uh, of Democrats, 58% of Democrats say employers should punish employees for offensive Facebook posts. <clears throat> Which is ironic because those same Democrats also believe it's not fair for NFL teams to punish all of their protesting players by firing them. So this is an amazing stat. 58% of Democrats say employees should punish them, uh, say employers should punish employees for offensive Facebook posts, but they simultaneously also think it's unfair for somebody like Jerry Jones to say you have to stand for the national anthem on your job. Tell me that this is not an amazing uncovery. What you really find is that people disagree on what offensive is and just want you to punish people when they have opinions that are different than theirs. Uh, and I don't actually even disagree with this, but this one, 65% of Republicans say NFL players should be fired if they refuse to stand for the national anthem. I think you certainly could be fired if you refuse to stand for the national anthem. Uh, that is, This is all from a Cato Institute survey. I would encourage you guys to read it. I read it yesterday on the First Amendment. Downright sobering, terrifying, scary to think about the overall impact that could be out there when you study this uh, situation. So uh, this is also amazing. Final story for you. After like 5,000 years, they have suddenly found a new room, a new chamber, they believe, in the Great Pyramid of Giza, the largest, I believe, of the pyramids in Egypt. This is one of the most amazing things that I have heard in a long time. They've been studying this thing for thousands of years, they found the queen burial chamber, the king burial chamber, and now they have this brand new area in the center of the pyramid that they have just found that is evidently massive in the center part of the, the pyramid. And so when I read this, as somebody said already, this, they found the Stargate in it, I think they're going to find something amazing in the middle here. Like this is, to me, one of the best, coolest concepts for a story that I have ever heard what is actually in the center part of this pyramid that we have not been able to find for nearly 5,000 years and suddenly we found it? Like, what is in there to be seen? They say they're not going to try to go explore it. I think it's unbelievably insane. You have to go explore this thing. You have to go in there and figure out what this huge new opening inside of the Pyramid of Giza is. I mean, I find it to be fascinating that we could never find this. Is this going to be our portal where we find out that the ancient Egyptians actually came here from Mars and had figured out how to travel? Like, I think all these crazy things, amazing books that could be written about what's actually hidden in the center of the Egyptian pyramids. People don't know how they built these things for years. What if we found out that they were in, in some way engaging in conversations with other societies. I don't know what it is. Maybe it's a mummy that comes back to life. There's so many different things that we could find in the center of the Egyptian pyramid, but I want to know what exactly is in there. Yeah, that would be amazing. If they opened it up and they just found everything, like all the iPhones. What if they opened it up and found out that time traveling had been going on for a long time and that this was the final tomb 
of everybody who had successfully time traveled. And they opened it up and they're expecting to find all this gold and incense and all these different Egyptian antiquities. And instead they open it up and it's like just modern day humans who have been entombed there and they're surrounded by all of their modern day jewels such as the iPhone. Or we open it up and it actually is like some sort of portal that just swarms, takes over the rest of the world. I don't know. Could be a DBAP shirt. Could be me. Could be me 50 years in the future. Could be like a, like back to the future. You can't go back in time. You see yourself. What if you just saw an Egyptian mummy laying there in a DBAP shirt? Talk about a product placement. That'd be incredible. Anybody in Egypt knows how to get into this sacred tomb. We can find a mummy there, put him in a DBAP shirt. Would be an incredible discovery. Uh, could be a Browns quarterback. Could be a good Browns quarterback coming back from the future. Could be Johnny Manziel. Who knows what it's going to be. Uh, this is all fascinating stuff, but this is a real story. And uh, I am intrigued. I think you got to explore it. I think Egypt's letting us down when they're saying they're not going to check it out. I think 100% you have to go in and see what is actually there. Uh, maybe they got Biff. Maybe they got Biff from Back to the Future in there with the sports book. Maybe I could go out and start winning every gambling pick again. Can you imagine the value of Outkick VIP if suddenly I knew how every game was going to end? Uh, so I think uh, I think it'll be incredible. I think they'll also go in. We have to take over Egypt now. Uh, I agree. I agree that uh, this is uh, intriguing. Um, so if you haven't read the articles about this, you need to go read the articles about this. It is an incredible find, and I can't believe that it has taken this long for us to uh, to discover it. Uh, all right, ESPN has a new social media policy. A bunch of you are asking about it. Uh, it's in response in some way, I think, to Jamel Hill, frankly. Uh, who blocked me on Twitter, so I don't have any idea what she's tweeting about now. But I think ESPN is trying to argue that they are not political in nature. They are going to fail. I don't think this new policy is going to uh, make much of a difference right there. I am totally geeked out over the pyramid fine. I'm going to talk about the pyramid fine tomorrow on the radio. I'm going to open the phone lines up and be like, what do you think is actually existing in the center of this pyramid? I'm also going to tweet out the link to everything associated with that. Uh, I'll probably survive from being blocked. Any questions? I ran through the the, the, the discussion points. Um, I uh, tweeted out, showed you the picture of Snoop Dogg. Uh, but people want to know about the Senate run. Um, I, I've got still a lot of due diligence to do. We're doing a lot of due diligence on the Senate run. We got to figure out what I have to give up, what I can continue to do. Got to figure out who's running. Is Phil Bredesen going to run as a Democrat? That would throw a monkey wrench into the equation because he's actually a good candidate. Um, I think he would make a good senator. I do, Phil Bredesen. Um, Mar Marsha Blackburn is an idiot, like uh, an absolute imbecile, so uh, they can't have her representing the state. Uh, so there are lots of uh, lots of different directions we could go there. I will be up in Washington, D.C. We're going to have an OutKick VIP event. I'm going straight from the SEC title game in Atlanta to fly to D.C., and uh, I'm going to go to the Supreme Court to see the argument over the sports gambling law uh, that they are arguing on Monday. I believe it's the 3rd of December or the 4th of December, whatever that Monday is. So I'm going to be up in D.C. for several days then, and I'm going to have some meetings with people about what would be required to run as an independent uh, in Washington, D.C. With, uh, with that going on. So uh, it, should be a, uh, it should be a lot of fun. Yes, we will have another meetup in Atlanta for the SEC title game or... I might save it for the national title game because I'll be back down in Atlanta because this year's national title game is in Atlanta as well. Uh, but yes, I'll be in Atlanta in December. I'll be in Atlanta in January. I'll be up in, uh, in D.C., I believe also in New York. We may be doing a New York event around that same time. Also going to be out in Vegas before long. And I'm going to get down to Texas, hit Dallas, hit Houston, be able to do uh, some meetups, uh, hopefully before the end of the year associated with those. As well, yes, I can win as an independent. Um, so I appreciate all of you. Uh, my name is Clay Travis. We'll be live tomorrow, six to nine a.m. Eastern, Sirius XM channel two eighteen, XM channel two hundred two, as well as two hundred and fifty plus AM FM stations. My thanks and congratulations to the Houston uh, listeners on seven ninety a.m. as well as to the Houston Outkick fans who also overlap as Astros fans. Congratulations on that big win. Condolences to Dodger fans. We are on both the Dodgers affiliate and the Astros affiliate, so we've had massive audiences throughout the World Series reacting to our show. Go buy your DBAP shirts. We're almost sold out, um, and it's perfect time now to start buying for the holiday season. I am Clay Travis. This is Outkick the Coverage. I appreciate all of your support, DBAP boys and girls, and remember, no matter what you do, even if nobody else loves you, this guy does. Gambling picks are going 11-0. Go get them. Mailbag will be up tomorrow. Questions for me, claytravis at gmail.com. Kisses to all of you. Thank you for coming to hang out with me. I am Clay Travis, and this has been Outkick, the show.